from the period of initial settlement until uh, about uh, 1400 AD, a continuous tradition of depositing pottery in the described manner was active in the study area, so the inner Congo basin, stretching of over approximately 2500 years of continuous stylistic change and covering an area of seven by 400 kilometers, the whole study area was rem has remained continuously inhabited until the present day. And this view of continuity is actually held uh, across the, the disciplines. And, and also in African linguistics, uh, it is commonly taught that the uh, classification or the phylogeny, this, this tree is the latest phylogenetic classification of, of all Bantu languages. And, and I was a, a co-author of this study, Grolemund et al. 2015. Uh, it, it is assumed that this, uh, the phylogeny of present day Bantu languages uh, reflects uh, the original initial migration of Bantu speech communities across the continent, as, as is shown on, on, the, on the map on the right. And so, uh, as I say, I, me, myself, in my research, I, I have al also always thought that, that um, yeah, this, this uh, held the belief, and, and I, I don't say I no longer hold it now, but it, it gets a bit more complicated that one can uh, retrieve the past from the present. So leaving from present day uh, linguistic data, one can uh, get into the past uh, of the African continent. And this was also somehow the, the point of departure of my, my present uh, of our present Bantu first project, uh, which actually focuses on speakers of languages uh, uh, stemming from note six in the Grolemund et al. phylogeny. Uh, so the, the speakers of, of a branch of Bantu known as West Western or West Coastal Bantu. It's, it's a discrete subgroup within the Bantu family. And we uh, consider them, or we, uh, as the first Bantu speakers south of the forest, uh, according to the phylogeny of Grolemund et al. Uh, but what if today's Bantu speakers did not descend uh, in a direct line from those who originally settled the rainforest? And this, uh, this doubt uh, on continuity has actually been shed uh, since some um, 20 years in the field of Central African archaeology. Um, the notion that the early and late Iron Ages in Central Africa were separated by a period of population collapse uh, has been uh, considered for uh, Southern Cameroon and Gabon by, by for instance, Richard Osley's Lee. Mm -hmm. Uh, and his colleagues, uh, but also for by Pierre de Marais in, in, in uh, earlier uh, publication. So that, that's somehow an idea that has been uh, circulating in, in the field of Central African archaeology for, for quite some uh, time. But very often archaeologists have objected, no, no, it's, uh, this is just a local phenomenon uh, restricted to a very specific region, or it's an artifact of, of archaeological sampling. So it's a bias of research uh, methods and research traditions. And so um, as the uh, point of departure of the study I have uh, cited uh, before, we, we saw the need to, to come up with a large and honest uh, database, honest in the sense that it's openly uh, accessible and, and that the data are available uh, to everyone and can be reused uh, for, for different kind of models by, by um, other uh, authors, other scholars. And so um, our integrated analysis focused uh, on uh, quality screened archeological for, uh, 14C, so radiocarbon dates from seven countries in Central Africa in order to build a comprehensive supra-regional uh, analysis of well-dated archeological uh, records. And so we compile the data set. And if I say we, it's actually mainly Dirk Seidensticker, the first author of the paper, 
uh, with the assistance of, of Juanes Hubo, uh, they compiled a data set of 1,444 uh, C14 dates uh, from the study area uh, that are younger than uh, 2000 BCE, so 4,000 years. Uh, we included information on the archaeological assemblages. Each date was sampled for like pottery, metallurgical objects, uh, and edible fruit remains. And these are archaeological features that are uh, usually associated with the first Bantu speakers or with the expanding uh, Bantu speakers. And so this allowed us to evaluate 14 C uh, dates, C14 dates with regard to our study, taking into account the interpretation of the original authors and the results of subsequent analysis. And so um, uh, this uh, map on the right uh, shows the, the study region and sh uh, shows that we have uh, a subdivided uh, um, the, the study region, region in, in several sub uh, regions following uh, uh, scholarly uh, traditions. And so uh, the, the, the the analysis, uh, so where we link uh, population uh, history to uh, C14 dates, that was uh, solely based on radiocarbon dates assigned to class one. And this is about 1,149 because the, these were considered to be the most reliable and the ones unmistakably associated uh, to human uh, activity. Um, so our study analyzed demographic evolution in 11 distinct Central African regions, uh, as seen on the map on the right, and the demarcation of these regions is mainly based on strategies of archaeological surveying specific to individual projects and modern day national borders affecting those strategies. So each surveying approach potentially involves uh, sampling biases. But with such specific biases uh, confined to one or a few region or cross regional analysis is expected to be relatively free of systematic sampling uh, related uh, yeah. bias. And so that's one, uh, uh, one uh, body of evidence, uh, so radiocarbon dates. Uh, but on top of that, we also, uh, and this again, this is mainly uh, the ar archaeologists uh, involved in, in the project or in the publication, uh, have looked at a, a second line of evidence, and this is uh, pottery, which is the only constant find category, category, with, category within the region. So we focused on compiling a comprehensive database of all well-described and directly dated pottery groups uh, in the Congo Basin. And the temporal distribution of all these groups can be seen in the figure on the left. Circles represent the highest probability calendar age of each pottery-linked uh, radiocarbon date, and the intensity of gray shading is proportional to the summed probability of the calendar age windows of all pottery occurrences per type. So as you can already see, a certain pattern emerges. In most regions, the earliest pottery dates into the first millennium uh, BCE, but towards the mid of the first millennium CE, so common era, these sequences end. And only in the beginning of the second millennium, a common era ceramics can be found again. So uh, already in, in the pottery uh, analysis, supra-regional analysis of pottery groups as identified by other experts, we, we see uh, a break in between uh, the early and late uh, Iron Age. And so in order to um, demarcate um, uh, periods with, with high and so th these are the different uh, the different models for, for the subregions, but but I'll uh, immediately skip to the, the global uh, pattern. And so to, to in order to uh, demarcate uh, periods 
uh, with high and low human activity. So according to uh, C14 dates, we compared the observed uh, empirical uh, sun probability distributions of archaeological uh, radiocarbon dates with uh, hypothetical models of uniform linear exponential and logistic uh, population uh, growth. Um, and so there is a, a statistical uh, analysis behind this. I, I won't go into to details here. All, all the, the details can be found in, in the paper itself and the supplementary materials. But this allowed us to identify periods during which the empirical uh, sum probability uh, distribution, so the, the distributions of C14 dates uh, for specific regions and for the global study area, uh, statistically uh, exceed in a significant way uh, or fall short of the theoretical uh, models. And so such periods would be considered of, as periods of more or less uh, intense human activity. Uh, and these are uh, visualized here respectively by blue and red uh, shading. So where it exceeds the expected model, it's uh, marked in blue, where it uh, falls short, it's uh, in red. So these are periods of high and low uh, activity. And as you can see, uh, uh, the, the pattern observed within the empirical SPD results in ver very similar phases of more or less uh, human activity in all four models uh, tested. Uh, most importantly, all four models indicate a significant drop in human activity in the second half of the first uh, millennium. And... Um, so what is uh, important here? So it, in, in order uh, to, to better characterize the results of these tests against hypothetical growth models, we overlay them with the, within a single figure, uh, which is the one shown on the left. And the darker the color shading, the more reliable the results as the period of more or less intense human activity was detected in multiple growth models. And so in this figure, we, we include the logic, logistic growth model as it's probably the most relevant with regard to the boundary expansion, which is often presented as a large scale and exceptionally rapid uh, process uh, of migration followed by a continuous presence of Bantu speaking people after the initial expansion. And so in this figure, we include, uh, the, 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 for that reason, we include the logistic growth model. Um, and so uh, you, you see uh, th this, uh, to better characterize, sorry, the, the magnitude of, of demographic change during these phases, we calculated the rate of change in some probability distribution and defined uh, those changes in exceeding the first quartile of all positive growth rates as expansion and all the other way around as collapse or uh, decline or collapse where, where the rate of, ex of change is lower than the first quartile of all negative growth rates. And so uh, this is marked in this figure, which result enabled us to comprehensively and statistically assess radiocarbon dates at the scale of the entire rainforest. And so all four models predict a significant setback in radiocarbon dates and thus human activity for the period between uh, 600 and a thousand uh, CE, so AD of the common era. So pre preceded by a collapse starting around 400 uh, of the common uh, era. Uh, we also considered similar data sets from the Southern, Southern Congo Basin woodlands, uh, regions uh, I and J and Bioko Island in the Gulf of Guinea, uh, region K, two areas adjacent to the present day forest, Congo forest, 
And uh, what we see, this is the, the, um, the curve uh, below. Uh, what, what we see in, is, is exactly the opposite um, trend. So in the woodland south of the Congo Basin, most dates originating uh, from the Upemba depression in, in present day Katanga, the period of elevated human activity starts only at about 600 uh, CE, common era. And this is uh, considerably later than further north and correlate with the period of less intense hum human activity uh, before. So we don't establish a causal relation between what happens in the Congo rainforest and what we see in uh, adjacent regions, we only say that there is uh, an opposite trend or a different trend uh, uh, outside of the Congo uh, rainforest. Um, so an, an analysis of the temporal distribution of the recognized pottery groups, and that's there are other line of evidence, archaeological evidence, these are the pottery groups. Uh, in, the, in the Congo rainforest shows a marked repetition of the same uh, two-phase settlement pattern during the early Iron Age and late Iron Age. So each expansion phase, uh, which are the light gray bars in uh, the figure on the left, uh, is characterized by an initially low but increasing number of pottery groups as seen in panel A on the left. And these pottery groups tend to be st statistically homogeneous across large number of sites, as can be seen in panel B, and consequently tend to have a large distribution area shown in panel C. In con contrast to the subs subsequent periods of high activity, uh, dark gray bars, uh, which are characterized by a large number of different pottery groups, of which many are found at only a few sites and consequently have a smaller mean area of distribution. And this is indicative of what we call a regionalization process. Uh, for, for that's what we would, in, for a linguist, this very much resembles a pattern of uh, language expansion. So a language expanding over a given area and then what we call here regionalization would be a dialect formation or language diversion. So the, the involvement, uh, the, the development of different uh, languages. In the inner Congo basin, which is region F uh, on, the, on the map, uh, the first expansion period is characterized by the dominance of the well-known Imbonga group, which you see uh, down uh, down on the left, um, which spread over a vast area within less than 200 years and over the subsequent 500 years it morphed into multiple distinct uh, styles uh, whose unique characteristics in terms of vessel shapes and decorations all disappeared during the collapse period and then from a uh, thousand uh, thousand hundred uh, common era onwards a previously unknown uh, pottery type called bondongo that's the blue you see uh, started to spread again emerge uh, over a large area and then again uh, the same regionalization happened it morphed into regional specializations within the next uh, few uh, centuries. Uh, similar patterns have been uh, documented or argued for in, in Gabon, uh, for where the widespread Okala pottery co coincides with the early Iron Age expansion period and then uh, during the subsequent uh, regionalization period it, it morphed into different uh, groups. Uh, so we, we see the same uh, regionalization patterns over different uh, regions. Uh, this is uh, uh, further details for the, the inner Congo basin, but I, I won't go into them uh, here. Uh, what is interesting, so apart from uh, archaeological evidence, we, we have also uh, looked at genetic uh, evidence, so modern uh, DNA data, but uh, our, 
unfortunately, our study region is not well uh, documented in, in that regard. Uh, genetically speaking, the whole study area, there are no uh, genetic uh, data available. But the, there is one specific study uh, area, so Gabon, uh, where we, which corresponds to region B, uh, where uh, there is a very uh, abundant genetic data for different uh, communities available. And um, so, so we tested a variation in effective population sites of Bantu speaking uh, communities in Gabon over the last 130 generations. And actually, uh, these were the geneticists involved in the study, uh, Karina Schlebusch and uh, Cesar Lima Fortes. They actually relied on existing uh, genetic studies uh, by Patin et, uh, and his colleagues, and they, they uh, apply the new analysis uh, method to these data. And what uh, the data show is that all communities, Bantu speaking communities sampled in um, Gabon displays, display, sorry, a remarkably similar pattern indicative of very low population size until about 35 generations ago. So that's around a thousand uh, common era. And after a thousand common era, the, the population sizes of individual communities diverge with growth in most of them becoming exponential from a thousand three hundred uh, common era onwards. And so within the uncertainty, of course, of the applied generation time, which is 30 years, this strong uh, demographic expansion coincides exactly with the sec second phase of increasing human activity shown in the combined archaeological data. So uh, genetic data support, or at least do not contradict for that specific region or archaeological in inferences that today's Bantu speaking communities in Gabon did not move into that area of the rainforest before the second expansion phase, so after the population collapse. And so do not descend directly from its early Iron Age inhabitants. So, and this actually fits in quite well with the linguistic data uh, because the centers of origins of, of the Bantu languages spoken by these communities um, so the, the actually belong to the two distinct clades, and namely Northwestern Bantu, these are uh, marked in green and West Western or West Coastal Bantu marked in uh, orange. And so the, the centers of origin of the languages spoken by these people, so here we speak about the languages, uh, are actually situated in both cases outside of Gabon. So uh, further to the north for Northwest Bantu languages. So their closest relatives are in uh, Cameroon and for West Western Bantu uh, as shown on uh, this map. So West Western or West Coastal Bantu uh, within our uh, project team, we have uh, situated the homeland uh, following an in-depth phylogenetic study uh, to um, the area in between the Quilu, or rather even Kamcha and Kasai rivers uh, in uh, the Quilu province, the present day Quilu province of the DRC. So that's uh, several hundreds of kilometers to the east of uh, Gabon. And we, we, um, we say that from this homeland, um, the, there were at least two distinct expansions uh, towards the Atlantic coast. So the one in green, which is uh, the Kikongo language cluster. So that's the, what we are know as, as the Kikongo languages. And then later on, the language of the Congo kingdom uh, emerges from that expansion. Uh, and the red one is uh, the, the, the languages, the West Western or West Coastal Bantu languages of Gabon, 
uh, mostly originate from from the the red marked uh, expansion uh, towards the atlantic so uh, two distinct expansions but so at the beginning of the project we always assumed that these were the first bound to speak as south of the rainforest that the 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 ancestors of of those language communities were the first bound to speaking settlers in uh, the area however after uh, this study we, we are uh, left a bit puzzled and we wonder uh, whether the expansion of proto west coastal bantu and and the subsequent expansion of west coastal bantu languages can still be associated with the first bantu speaking settlements or uh, whether it uh, represents a later uh, event so uh, now to speak about the possible drivers of our uh, population collapse uh, it's important uh, to know that uh, the initial migration of pottery producing Bantu speech communities into the present day Congo area is thought to have been facilitated by a reduction of forest cover during a widespread drought between 500 and uh, BC and, and the, the turn of, of the era. So, but that's the initial expansion. So afterwards, um, the, the, the first half uh, of the first millennium uh, of common era, the, the rainforest was recovering from severe disturbance and hot and damp conditions uh, may have impeded the cultivation of, of some traditional crops, uh, while palm oil and other natural resources on which ancestral bound to speech communities depended uh, may have become scarce. Uh, but uh, this doesn't seem to be a sufficient reason to, to assume a population uh, collapse. And uh, on the other hand, a wetter climate may have triggered more frequent outbursts of vector-borne uh, diseases. So, and that's, a, it's along those uh, lines we, we have tried to account for the population collapse, but, uh, and here I, I must admit, this is the most speculative uh, part of our, our uh, paper, and it's not really an explanation, and it's certainly not based on empirical evidence, but it's, it's a first attempt uh, to account for it. And uh, what we see is a broad coincidence between the population collapse in the Congo rainforest and the so-called uh, Justinian plague, as also uh, De Solieu et al. Uh, noted in 2017, something which we did not know at, at the time uh, of uh, the publication of our paper. And so this um, plague is caused by a bacteria known as Yersinia pestis, which is transmitted by fleas. Uh, and um, this long-lasting pandemic is generally regarded as one of the many factors leading to the collapse of the Roman Empire and may have killed up to a mil 100 million people in Asia, Europe, and indeed also Africa. Because uh, very often, but or, or several people have uh, argued, but that's also contested, that the center of its diffusion would be present-day Ethiopia, uh, where it may have contributed to the collapse of the Axum, Axumite Empire in, in the present-day region, uh, uh, which has been, unfortunately, quite a bit in the news of, of Tigre in, in Ethiopia. So um, we don't have direct evidence, uh, empirical evidence for the presence of this uh, at that time uh, of the presence of that bacteria in, in, in Central Africa or for contact between Ethiopia and Central Africa. However, there is robust genetic evidence for long, the long-standing presence of Yersinia pestis in Central Africa. One particular strain or, or variant, uh, as we have the variants today of, of the coronavirus, uh, is found exclusively in the DRC, 
Zambia, Kenya, and Uganda since at least 300 years. And it's the oldest living strain closely related to the 14th century Black Death uh, lineage, in, which is well known from, from uh, Europe. So uh, just this is just to say that Yersinia pestis uh, is uh, present in Central Africa, but uh, we don't have direct evidence for its presence during the our period of population uh, collapse. So um, the question now is uh, for for people. Uh, in African studies, uh, how how to deal uh, with this uh, idea of uh, spread over spread about the fact uh, uh, with the fact that maybe we cannot recover uh, the present uh, the past directly uh, from uh, the past and but I, I won't go into this uh, very detailed, but, but what I, I see as a scholar uh, yeah, whose core business is dealing with the African past from uh, bodies of evidence uh, that are situated in the present, uh, mainly linguistic, but also genetic uh, data uh, in, up, in conjunction with really uh, empirical evidence from the past, mainly uh, archaeology. Uh, what, how can we uh, go about uh, retrieving these lost parts uh, from the rainforest? And um, as we, we, we have, uh, as people involved in, in this kind of studies know, uh, the interdisciplinary uh, historical studies of the African past have often been criticized as, as uh, uh, for their circular reasoning. And so there is a tendency to make data sets from different disciplines match. But uh, I'm more and more convinced that it might be historically more informative to focus on mismatches uh, between the disciplines to uncover spread over spread uh, events. And uh, there are uh, quite some mismatches in the archaeological, uh, uh, in, in the, in the, between the different bodies of evidence, uh, for instance, um, between archaeological and linguistic data. So these are the oldest uh, pottery traditions from the study area. And if you look at um, uh, the, the, the West Coastal Bantu distribution area, uh, the oldest pottery traditions today uh, are actually found along the coast, uh, namely along the Atlantic coast around Point Noir. Uh, and they are as old as, as 1000 uh, BC. So, um, as you remember, we situated the West Coastal Bantu homeland in, in the interior towards the east. So there seems to be a mismatch there uh, between what the archaeological data tell us if we assume that the oldest pottery in the region was indeed uh, produced by Bantu speakers and what the linguistic data uh, suggest. Of course, uh, we do have very little archaeological data from uh, the homeland region, and that was one of the main aims uh, of, of the Bantu First project to do new archaeological fieldwork in, in that region. And Igor Matonda, has, has, uh, a Congolese archaeologist, has done fieldwork there for a project in, in 2019, 2020, and, and he, he and another colleague will do more fieldwork um, this year, but from the data obtained so far and the, the radiocarbon dates uh, and the pottery found there, but of course it's a very few and little data, but for the time being, we do not have dates that are, are older than the ones found at the coast. So uh, there, there seems to be uh, a mismatch there uh, between uh, linguistics and archeology. span So, 
Uh, could this mean uh, that, for instance, there was an older phase of Bantu expansion along the coast, uh, that there were speakers of Bantu languages uh, that uh, sh lost their language, their ancestral languages, uh, by shifting to uh, newly arriving West Coastal Bantu languages from the East. So that's something uh, we should uh, embrace or uh, uh, examine more uh, deeply in, in future research. Uh, for linguists, um, but I don't think there are lots of them in the audience, uh, I think one of the, the, the pathways to retrieve lost paths in the, from the rainforest is to embrace more uh, irregularity. And, and for in all the studies, uh, like Mölik again, he, he had this old stratification model of uh, Bantu expansion, where he uh, distinguished, uh, presented like uh, the Bantu languages, the Bantu language history as a big lasagna. Uh, it's a very complex model, but I think it merits uh, revisitation uh, in the light of the new data. And uh, this map shows, but I won't go into details here, but uh, we often uh, assume or we are taught that uh, language uh, or and certainly sound change in the world's languages is a absolutely regular uh, phenomenon. But this map uh, where each pie chart represents a language and uh, the outcome of a specific sound change uh, and different uh, colors in a pie chart um, show different reflexes or outcomes of a, of a sound change. Uh, this map shows that uh, uh, sound change in the West Coastal Bantu languages is definitely not regular, but uh, tends to be uh, irregular and that irregularity is rather the norm uh, than uh, the exception. So how to account for this uh, irregularity, uh, we think that um, spread over spread might be one uh, of the explanations. So to conclude, uh, I've presented here four independent lines of evidence, each having possible shortcomings, uh, but uh, pointing conjointly towards a major population collapse in the Congo rainforest between 400 and 600 of the common era followed uh, by a major resettlement only centuries later. It is around a thousand uh, uh, common era. So there are four lines of evidence, a clearly bimodal temporal distribution of all reliable and relevant radiocarbon dates, the near simultaneous occurrence of a prominent setback in human activity in its eight distinct regions, uh, supra-regional ceramic analysis showing two distinct stylistic periods, iron, uh, early Iron Age versus late Iron Age, each of them consisting of an expansion phase with widespread spread pottery styles and a re regionalization phase with many more local pottery styles and a uh, fourth line of evidence is uh, estimates of past effective population sizes based on genetic uh, data. And so, although migrating Bantu speakers definitely spread their languages from the Bantu homeland in the Cameroonian Nigerian borderland to Southern Africa, their present day geographic distribution does not necessarily reflect the original migration of Bantu speech communities. And analysis, uh, analysis of human uh, DNA uh, from modern day Bantu speakers already indicated uh, several expansion phases succeeding each other, obliterating any possible, possible founder event and camouflaging the genetic signature of the first migration. So uh, no archeological data plead for a similar model of spread over spread uh, model of Bantu language history, uh, rather than to reconstruct the dispersal of Bantu speaks and the languages as a single and long-term continuous macro, macro event, not only in Central Africa, but also in uh, Southern Africa, at least uh, there as well. And so such spread over spread events must have led to recurrent instances of Bantu 
internal language shift. So communities abandoning their ancestral Bantu language in favor of another socially more su successful Bantu language. And today the social linguistic process is known to be one of the principal causes of language death in Central Africa or other parts of Africa. Uh, uh, and must also have been known in prehistoric times. Uh, think of um, East Africa, where Swahili, the very successful Bantu language Swahili is, is uh, a, a serious threat to, to a lot of uh, minority Bantu languages, the same for Lingala in, in the Western part of, of Central Africa. Um, so attempts to disentangle successive strata, successive strata of Bantu language history have been rare and their implications for historical linguistic method have never been fully assessed. And uh, in my humble opinion, uh, embracing mismatches between the disciplines and irregularity in linguistic data might be ways of recovering such dead ends in the demographic history of Bantu speech communities. This being said, uh, still many Congo rainforest spots uh, remain to uncover. Thank you for your attention. Mm -hmm.